2020 has been an interesting year. From the perspective of an Aussie, we've had devastating bushfires, the cancellation of the F1, and that pain will never go away, maybe until next year, and of course the global pandemic, but not everything in 2020 has sucked. 2020 has been the year of doing things you've never had time to do. Learn how to cook, paint the fence, read that book, and for me, it was creating this YouTube channel to not only review upcoming games, but also to go back and take a look at some games that I loved during my younger years when I had hair on my head to see if those games still hold up. Now I've played some fantastic games this year alone and some not so fantastic. So I thought I'd count down my top five games of the year to wrap up 2020 and I'm doing a giveaway as well. So be sure to hold that to the end of the video to find out what's up for grabs and how to enter. Special present. I don't want to wait. I want it now. I want the children to see. Ooh. Oh, right. Later. <laughs> One of the first games to release in 2020, and to be honest, I was more excited for this title than I was for Cyberpunk 2077, and that's Dragon Ball Kakarot, an open world game where yet again players relive the story of Dragon Ball Z, starting of course in Season 1 and working your way through to the Battle of Gods and Resurrection of F. Hell, the opening of the game is Goku and Gohan out exploring the world using the flying Nimbus to fly around because Goku didn't know how to fly at that point. Now while it is a pretty damn good game, there were some issues that kept it from achieving greatness. The cutscenes are quite long and don't naturally flow, they feel quite static and robotic. Also yes, Kakarot is a open world game, but it's small sub open worlds like the Avengers game that also released this year. So rather than flying from Kami's lookout to Master Roshi's house, you'll need to go to the world map and then choose the next area, which breaks up the gameplay and also removes any sense of urgency. For example, if you had to quickly get to Capsule Corp or the desert to wait for Freezer to return, rather than hauling ass, you would go to the world map and then move to the desert and then fly to the marker. The combat and gameplay is solid. It did however take some time for me to get used to these controls as it didn't feel fluid at least to me. The B button and reminder I played most of my games in 2020 on an Xbox was melee where previously or expectedly I thought it would be X. The triggers and bumpers are used to fly up and down when you're roaming around and it didn't feel natural. Though it's an RPG, you can't change the clothes that characters are wearing. It would have been great if you could choose to wear old outfits for certain characters, but by wearing the more relevant newer and seasoned outfits, you'll have better stats. Like if Piccolo's cape gave him better defense, but it made him slower. If Goku fought without his shoes and his armbands, he'd be faster, but he'd take more damage. You get my point. Finally, one of the weird things is when you transform into a Super Saiyan and your energy bar will continue to deplete. With a whole lead up to the fight with Cell, Goku forces Gohan to learn and sustain his Super Saiyan form without it taxing his body. This is how Frieza loses to Goku and Vegeta in Resurrection of F for fuck's sake. But it is a solid, fun Dragon Ball game, and if we continue to get titles like this, it won't be long before we get the ultimate Dragon Ball game. My first experience with the Mafia game was Mafia 2 earlier this year, and while it was pretty damn fun, to me it paled in comparison to the remake of Mafia that released a couple of months ago. The combat was pretty good, and driving around in 1930s cars were challenging, but fun. Unlike the overly sensitive and awkward driving of Cyberpunk 2077, the driving of Mafia would alter depending on what vehicle you drove. If you drove a truck or a cab fast, it would handle like an Ikea bed at a brothel falling apart. Sports cars gave a gruff oof when fired up and they handled pretty well. But the gameplay couldn't hold up to the story. There were some fantastic missions and character moments in Mafia where I actually cared if people lived or died. Again though, there were some graphical bugs that while yes they were small, they ruined immersion. You can see one of these bugs in my video review where a truck appears out of nowhere. Mafia is also a story game, and while it does have an open world setting, it isn't an open world game like GTA or Mafia 2. After you finish a mission, time will progress and you'll move on to the next mission. Once you finish the main campaign, there's no real reason to return to Mafia as well. But after finishing Mafia, I immediately showed Mrs. Duty the first Godfather movie. It was one of those games that gets you on a high for a genre, and then you keep following it for a while.
A smaller game with a smaller price tag, but it was still a pretty solid game for 2020, and that's Star Wars Squadrons. Now I'm a Star Wars fan of unhealthy proportions, and Squadrons gave me my dogfighting fix. In Battlefront 2, the only mode I cared for was the Starfighter mode, and that died off pretty quick when that mode wasn't really supported after launch. Squadrons was the title that Motive Studio was working on while DICE kept working on Battlefront 2. A first person only dogfighting game where five rebels, sorry, uh, New Republic, took on five Imperial fighters in dogfights and capital ship assaults. With a story mode that worked like a tutorial of how to play the game in every ship variant and, well, you know, the general how to play the game like a COD story mode does, Squadrons was a simple drop and release title. Though people loved Squadrons. The options to create your own pilot, customize your own starfighter and colors and bobbleheads in the cockpit, and the creme de la creme, being able to play the entire game in VR. But unfortunately, I don't have VR available to me yet. But though people love the game and you can easily immerse yourself in squadrons, it doesn't have a whole lot of life in it. There are only two game modes with dogfights and capital ship assault, and that's it. Now you can play against AI and alongside your buddies, but even the easy AI difficulty, as there's only two different difficulties, is quite hard. In some instances, I've been firing away at a TIE fighter just waiting for it to explode, while on the flip side, I've piloted a TIE fighter and died from just one hit, like in the films. Squadrons was supposed to be a drop and run release, but due to its popularity and outcry from the community for DLC, Motive listened and actioned. We got the TIE Defender and the B-Wing, as well as new customization options and a new map. I've even done some random games against AI, playing alongside randoms, and as nerdy as it is, and as I sound, calling out your attack patterns, your plans, if you've got a tail, role-playing a little bit, it is a load of fun. I would have died countless times over if it wasn't for my wingman Davo. Now, if you're a Star Wars fan and you love the dogfight scenes for roughly 30 to 50 bucks, you can't go wrong. And now, if you have a VR or flight sticks or both, I think you're golden. Now, if you know what my number two game is, then you can probably guess what my number one will be. Now, it was a pretty hard decision as I was tossing up between these two entries, but my runner-up for Game of the Year 2020 is Doom Eternal. Now, obviously, Doom Eternal is a fantastic game and an amazing sequel to Doom 2016, but it was also a game that released just as lockdowns hit in Melbourne. So being stuck inside with nothing to do, I played Doom Eternal. Doom Eternal was also one of the last games I played before I started this channel, so in some ways, it inspired me to create this channel. But, well, let's actually get into why Doom Eternal's on the list. Fantastic graphics, gory executions, and the combat's so satisfying, there's no point putting my pants back on. We've got more of a focus on story and cinematics here, and even different environments that aren't just Mars inside and Mars outside. And while yes, it's got linear levels, there's reasons to return to Doom Eternal with soundtracks, weapons, and suit upgrades. Between levels, you return to the Fortress of Doom, where you can equip different outfits for your Slayer, listen to iconic themes from not only Doom, but franchises like Quake. There was more of a tacked on multiplayer mode, but it was interesting having two demon players summon lesser demons to take on a third player who was playing as the Doom Slayer. We even got what I would consider to be the physical embodiment of 2020 in the Marauder. Honestly, if 2020 was a person, it'd be this guy. The only thing negative I can really say about Doom was how intense it is. Playing the Ancient Gods DLC, I felt like I hadn't blinked in hours because blinking means dying, and my wrists and hands were aching with how fast I had to keep moving, and I was playing this on the easiest mode. But when the credits rolled for the Ancient Gods, and for, well, Doom Eternal as well, it was like I'd finished running a marathon. Exhausted, sweaty, and I'd shat myself a couple of times. Now, before I get on to what I consider to be my game of the year, here are some honourable mentions. Now, Rainbow Six Siege didn't release in 2020, obviously, but it would be my multiplayer game of the year. I put countless hours into Siege and obviously reviewed the new operators. Hell, I even just learned some great techniques and control layout from a mate of mine. Thank you, Maddo. When you look at it on paper too, I've also covered the game three times this year with each DLC drop. Some other mentions are Man Eater, a indie shark RPG, or Shark PG as it was marketed as. Now it was fun to play this creative and hilarious game created as this entertaining spoof comedic documentary narrated by Chris Parnell. 
Moving Out is a great house party couch co-op game just like Overcooked, and obviously playing with my mates and Mrs. Duty, Pivot was mentioned multiple times. Cyberpunk 2077 has been a load of fun, but it's also got a load of bugs, and is currently in a bit of a shitstorm at the moment. Now, as this is a brand new release, I've removed it from the contention as it's too fresh and it feels like a bit of a cop-out to be one of my games of the year. Now, for those of you who've checked out my previous content, you'll probably be able to guess what my game of the year is. Not only did I play the shit out of this year's entry and previous entries in the series, I spent what my wife thinks to be a outrageous amount of money on accessories to further enhance my experience, and that's Formula 1 2020. Now to some, it might just seem like a racing game that doesn't include throwing shells, bananas or striking people with lightning, and it is. But, it's also just like Doom Eternal. It can be a taxing and hard game at first, but after some time it gets easier as you start to learn the micro game. Now, I'm not going to completely nerd out about the sport itself, but F1 isn't just about coming first, it's about time. How fast can you go around the track? What tyres do you start the race on? When do you box to change for fresher tyres, the downforce settings, assists and more? Enabling assists like automatic braking and automatic transitions, sure, it makes the game easier. But by having these assists, it slows you down. Because you aren't making those changes yourself, the game is doing it for you. By comparing automatic gear changes to manual gear changes, you save roughly half a second by doing them yourself. By braking for yourself, you can control when you hit the pedal and those fractions of a second add up at the end of the lap. F1 2019 acted like a drug. I started just driving around Melbourne, but by the time F1 2020 released, I purchased a cockpit and a steering wheel for my Xbox and I shaved three seconds off my time around Melbourne. Now it's all not just racing, but it is 90% of the game. Besides the multiplayer mode, there are two single player modes. My career is basically that you're a Formula 2 driver who's just made their way into Formula 1 and you sign onto a team basically what you'd expect by playing a NBA 2K title. My team is that you drive and make your own Formula 1 team. So rather than driving for Ferrari, Mercedes or McLaren, you make your own team. You act as the team's number one driver and you can recruit any driver, Hamilton included. Only negative is while you can make your own team, the sponsors you can have for your car are all fake and you can't even have a Honda or Mercedes logo on your car even though they provide you your engine. You'll also be able to upgrade all of the factors of your car. Create a character, design a helmet, pick dialogue options, everything. There's no way in hell anyone would let me sit inside a real F1 car, let alone drive one around a lap, because trust me, I fucking would. But Formula 1 2020 is the closest thing I'll get so far. Now, if you've stuck with me so far, for starters, thank you. 2020 has been an interesting year to say the least, but I've been stuck inside and I've created this channel, and seeing it grow from a handful of subscribers being a couple of my close mates, to a heap of great people interacting and enjoying content that I've created, and just being top people during a shit time, has honestly surprised me. So I'm doing my first giveaway. Now thanks to my friends Dom and Oz at Incognito Comics, I've got my comic of 2020 to give away. Yes, not only do I love video games, but I also read comic books. Now, if you're in Australia and you're looking for a fantastic comic book store, check out Incognito Comics. They've got a great range of new releases, rare collections, issues, trades, omnibuses, statues, and basically anything for any fan of all ages. The link is in the description below. Anyway, I've read a load of comic books this year. You get a bit of downtime when a video is exporting in 4K, and by far the best book I've read this year is a crossover comic. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles crossover with the Mighty Morphing Power Rangers. It's a fantastic book that bleeds 90s TV and nostalgia, and a fantastic story as well. Now to go into the running to win the Collected Trade paperback of Power Rangers Ninja Turtles, all you need to do is subscribe to this channel and comment below on what your game of 2020 is and why. The winner will be announced in Feb of 2021, both on my Twitter account, feel free to chuck us a follow and reach out there, and of course I'll announce the winner in Feb on this channel too. But that's it for me in 2020. There's obviously been a heap of games I've played out this year, and these are just my top five. Some great, some meh, some not so great. Now I'll be going back to Gears 5 to review the Hive Busters DLC, maybe doing a Siege 2020 summary, but I'm curious for your game of the year, and trust me, Ninja Turtles Power Rangers is a fantastic book, and this competition is open worldwide. 
Anyway, I hope you guys had a fantastic holiday season, and let's hope 2021 gives us some great games, some great memories, and finally lets us go outside.